built on the banks where four rivers converge. The city of Phnom Penh, founded in the 15th century, used to be called Krong Chattamuk, the city of four faces. Today, over one and a half million people live in the noisy, hectic capital of Cambodia. Sheltered from the bustle of the town, this is Wat Phnom. The temple pays tribute to Phnom Penh's founder, Daun Penh, Grandma Penh, as she is called here. Legend recounts that she discovered statues of Buddha on the banks of the Mekong River and built this shrine to house them in the 14th century. The residents of the town gather here to ask favors of the gods and to have the future told by the Acha, the soothsayer of the sanctuary. You have escaped death and evil will backfire on its creator. You have problems at work, but it will all end well. If your wish is granted, custom dictates that you return to make an offering to the founder of the city. In Phnom Penh, construction of the royal palace was finished in the mid-19th century, when King Norodom I decided to move from Udong, the former capital. The palace sits high up in the heart of the city. This is where the current king of Cambodia lives. On this white horse, the great builder of the city, Norodom I, is curiously dressed in European clothes. Legend has surrounded this astonishing statue since the end of the 19th century. Norodom I is said to have decapitated the statue and put his own head on it in place of Napoleon III's. Today, the country is ruled by a constitutional monarchy and the same dynasty that has been in power for over 150 years. One of its members has made a particular mark on his country's history. King Norodom Sainuk was born in 1922 in Phnom Penh. His people called him the Father King and he himself called the Cambodians his children. His life was intimately linked to the history of his country. He was there during all the troubles and upheavals that Cambodia experienced. Ten thousand a kilo, that's expensive, isn't it? Yeah, it's usually four or five thousand, but it's not the season. Okay, give me a kilo. See you soon. Okay, see you soon.
We are at the Place de la Poste, the heart of the French administrative district, which rather than a square is in fact a street with buildings laid out in a very distinct way. For the architect Daniel Fabre, a square should not be industrial, that is to say, square or rectangular, but humanist. Depending on where you're standing, the eye recreates the square, so it focuses on the vision of each individual. Of course, the buildings symbolize the establishment of French power. For example, we have the post office, which was the post office and telephone exchange at the time. At the far end is the commissariat, which had a floor added in the 1920s. But the original part, like all these buildings, was built between 1889 and 1897. And finally, the Grand Hotel at the back, with a superb 18th century facade where illustrious guests from the Protectorate were received. This is the heart of the French administrative district. After the First World War, nearly a million French lived in Phnom Penh. Their meeting point was the cafe at the Grand Hotel, the only cafe in the city. For about 30 years, Phnom Penh flourished. After independence in 1953, the city continued to grow until the Khmer Rouge arrived. On the 17th of April, 1975, they marched through the streets of Phnom Penh. But soon, they emptied the capital of nearly all its population. The city was left abandoned for over three years. Today, the Chinese Quarter, the oldest district in the city, still bears traces of this tragic period. Its repopulation after the fall of the Khmer Rouge generated a strange urban landscape. Like this temple, completely swamped by newer constructions. Here we have the old central Chinese temple, its soul destroyed. It has been swamped by every imaginable type of building. Scooters ride through it, that happens a lot. When you see the name of the temple, the Palace of the Jade Mountain, and the use of the colors, the green, the blue here and there, you know it is definitely Chinese. But look here, for example, there's the base of a column, a very characteristic entrance to a temple. And here we have beautiful tiles, which are still here, almost as they were. And now we're going into the heart of the temple. And when you look up, you can see the temple roof, what's left of it, with beautiful wooden panels, which were originally painted. You can still make out the colors a little bit, and there are also beautiful plaques covered in gold leaf. People wanted to buy them to resell them, but they refused to sell them because it might have brought bad luck to the local community. So there is a degree of protection of the temple. We're in a school and the classrooms have lost all their original character and been turned into apartments. The school's administrative building has also been converted into apartments. When in 1979 people came back to town, they went where they could, moved in wherever they could. They had provisional title deeds which the head of the village handed out and signed. And as the old land registry had been destroyed, there were no longer any documents which showed the former owners' rights of ownership. So people set up home wherever they could and the building has never again been used for its original purpose as a school. At the other end of town, north of the Royal Palace, is the National Museum of Phnom Penh.
The National Museum houses over 14,000 works of art, some dating back to the 5th century. It has the biggest collection of Khmer sculptures in the world. Like this one, said to be Jayavarman VII, the great conqueror and king who reigned in the 12th century. He left his mark on the famous World Heritage Site of Angkor, where this sculpture was found. The statue of Jayavarman VII, like all the other sculptures, has been restored in the museum's restoration workshop before going on public display. Stamping is one of the workshop's specialities, a technique which Sremom has mastered to perfection. Today, the young woman must reproduce inscriptions engraved on this stele from a temple in Anchor, a rare object dating from the 10th century. Thanks to Sremom's work, which breathes life into texts from across the centuries, archaeologists will be able to learn more about the history of the temple. They will also find invaluable information about the king who built it. From the 9th to the 14th centuries, the Khmer kings were the dominant rulers in this part of the world. It's impossible to talk of Khmer culture or history without going back to the very origins of Cambodia. The pride of a whole nation, and for a long time forgotten in the heart of the jungle, lies the extraordinary site of Angkor, the ancient capital. Over a million people lived here. The site stretches over 400 square kilometers four times the size of a city like Paris. It has 200 monuments, half of which are part of UNESCO's World Heritage List. Surrounded by water, the most famous and the largest temple in Angkor is Angkor Wat. The water system is one of the keys to Anchor's prosperity and longevity. It meant buildings could be serviced and several crops of rice harvested every year. The temple has millions of visitors every year. Today, it is still a living sanctuary for the Buddhist faith. Too busy starting wars, the Khmers failed to maintain the water system which brought them life. Angkor Wat and the rest of the site slowly faded and the capital was totally abandoned at the beginning of the 15th century. At the heart of the forest is the most beautiful example of a mountain temple, its style characteristic of Khmer architecture. The last mountain temple built in Angkor was this one, the Bayon Temple. Mountain temples are symbolic representations of Mount Meru. Mount Meru, which for the Hindus and the Buddhists represents the center of the world where gods and kings live. The Bayon is the temple of 173 faces. 
Each sculpted head is unique. Other marvels in the Bayon are the sculpted bas-reliefs which adorn the outer walls of the temple. Here we have these carvings which tell a story all along the outer gallery of the Bayon. These sculptures are highly detailed and expressive. Each character's face has different features. Some characters are smiling, some look unhappy, and it's unusual to find that in earlier pieces. These extraordinary bas reliefs cover an area that is 1,200 meters long and 5 meters high. They depict no less than 11,000 characters. They depict the great naval battles on the Tonle Sap. The sculptors also portrayed the everyday life of the Khmer people at the end of the 17th century. This scene depicts cooking, with a little oven here and the pot the rice is cooked in. There are skewers of fish. It's very detailed. This one shows a building which gives us an idea of the types of houses they had at the time. There are traces of tiles here, well executed, and ornamental roof tiles which suggest that this was the home of someone quite well off. They probably stored rice in these sacks, and here you see they show rice being transported. And just next to it, you see this Khmer woman who is giving birth sitting down and is being helped by her neighbors who are acting as midwives. You can also admire the dances of the Apsaras performed for the gods, an art practiced for centuries and engraved in stone. To rediscover this form of dance, we return to Phnom Penh. King Norodom Sihanouk's daughter, Princess Bopa Devi, became the star dancer of the Royal Ballet of Cambodia when she was 18. For over 30 years, she performed on stage all over the world. Today, she is the illustrious representative of an art which nearly died out. Somali is a teacher of Khmer dance at Phnom Penh School of Fine Arts. She is one of the few traditional dancers who managed to escape from the Khmer Rouge. These young girls are learning to hold themselves straight, their faces impassive. In Khmer dance, only the hands and feet express emotion. Each position has to express a feeling, and each gesture represents a word. This exercise is to make your wrists and fingers supple, and here you have to place your elbow on your knee and really open your shoulders. Place the back of your wrist under the hollow of your ankle and bend it back with your other hand. Keep your hips still and open up your shoulders. These exercises are very difficult because they make your body work against its natural posture. Naturally, our arms and hands go this way, forwards. But in traditional Khmer dance, you have to do the opposite. That is, it makes your hands go backwards. These exercises can do a lot of harm, 
It's only when you've learned to be extremely flexible that you're ready to perform. Head up. Learning the gestures is not the same for all pupils. The dancers who play a female role must keep their hands close together. The arms of the dancers who have male roles must spread wider and open like that. Music. Once the hands, the feet, the body and the hips have become flexible, these exercises must be done every morning. Traditional Khmer dance has a repertoire of about 4,500 gestures. These young dancers will get their diplomas after 10 years of gruelling discipline, training which is indispensable if they one day hope to join the Royal Ballet of Cambodia. That's good. You've worked hard. Did you understand? For these young women, their dream is to join the Royal Ballet. Today, they are getting ready to rehearse for an audition, where they will perform a dance practiced for over 1,000 years in Cambodia. For the first time, they wear the traditional costume of the dancing goddesses of the temples of Angkor. Originally, the Apsaras who wore this costume performed the dance to communicate with the gods. Traditionally, an Apsara always wore a white costume. That's the principal dancer, the one with the most important role. But there are three other colours, blue, red and green. White symbolises the diamond, or more exactly, the light reflected by the diamond. Blue represents a very precious stone, the sapphire. Red is the ruby, the green, the emerald. The way the skirt is folded is exactly as it is shown on the statues of the Apsaras, sculpted on the walls of the temples of Angkor Wat, and Bante Sri. Go back there. Go.
The sacred dance of the Apsaras is the living symbol of the city, an art which resonates in the hearts of all its people and which has lasted over the centuries, constantly being reborn, like the sun over the Mekong River.